、えー、おはようございます。パイコン JP2017 座長の吉田です。えー I am Yoshida, the chair of the PyCon JP 2017.、Uh, uh, let's begin、uh, PyCon JP 2017.、Uh, start. Uh, thank you all for coming. Mira san, Goraji, a r e g a t o g o z a i m a s Sankasha, this is the m o えー、620人以上の方が、えーえーえー、参加者いただきました、えー、スポンサーの方々含めるとおそらく、えーえー、あとスタッフその他800人以上になると思います、はいでえー、今回の、えー、とテーマとしては、えー、アウトプットフォローということで、まあ、皆さん、えーとアウトプットしていただきそれに対して皆さんあの参加者の方もフォあの反応レスポンスをしていただいてお互いえっ、ー、とつながってえっ、ー、と、えー、行きましょうということで今回のまあテーマあとまあこのロゴというふうにしていますはいじゃあ,あの皆さん楽しみましょう、はいはいえー、で、えー、今回あのー、あのスポンサーの方々にもえっ、ー、とご協力いただいておりますので、えー、簡単に紹介します、えー、ダイヤモンドスポンサーえっ、ー、とスクイーズさんですねすありがとうございます。えー、そして、えー、とプラチナムスポンサーの、えー、とモノタロウさん、えー、ラインさん、えー、とレティさんです。ありがとうございます。はいえー、それから、えー、とゴールドスポンサーの、えー、と発射の、えー、皆様方、ありがとうございます。シル,ボスシルバースポンサーの方々、えーシバサムソンの方々はえっ、ー、ともう一ページあります、ね。はい、ありがとうございます。それから、えー、パトロンスポンサーの方々、えー、こ,こちらの方々での学生チケットや遠方支援といったところのえっ、ー、とご協力をえっ、ー、といただいております。ありがとうございます。そしてあのあの宣伝あの広告いただいたまあメディアスポンサーの方々というところです。ありがとうございます。はい、それでは、えっ、ー、と、イベントの紹介に移りたいと思いますので、えー、変わります。はい、えー、それでは、これから、えー、えー、今日行われるイベントについて紹介していきます。えー、日本語担当は私、横山と。えー、英語担当。あ、uh, uh, good morning everyone. My name is Jonas. I will be announcing today's event、uh, in English. では、えー、イベント紹介の方を始めていきます。まず、えー、っとちょっとイベント紹介の前に、えー、っと受付でお配りした冊子なんですが、1点、えー、っと訂正点がございます、えー。キーノートの順番が逆になっております。正しくは、えー、1日目が、えー、ピーター・ウォンさん、2日目が堀越さんです。Uh, That today,、uh, Peter Wang will be presenting, and tomorrow, Masaki Horikoshi. Now, I'm going to show you how to do this. I'm going to talk to you about the talk. I'm going to talk to you about the talk. I'm going to talk to you about the talk. I'm going to talk to you about the talk. I'm going to talk to you about the talk. I'm going to talk to you about the talk. I'm going to talk to you about the talk. Uh, the talks will be on this floor in room number 201, which is here, 202, which is over there, and 203, which is next door. s Today, the English track will be in room 201. Eh, 次にメディア会議です。メディア会議は今年初めて開催される、eh, 新しい企画です。この企画の狙いは、エンジニアとメディア企業との交流の場を設け、新しい Python の書籍などを生み出すきっかけを作ることです。Eh, 技術系書籍や、eh, 出版に興味のある方は、ぜひこの企画にお越しください。Today,、uh, today we will have a media meeting during the lunch.、Um, unfortunately, this is only in Japanese, but、uh, please attend anyway if you're interested in、uh, connecting Python engineers and people from the media. Media Kai Gi no Kai Jo, Ni Kai no Ni Mara Ni, Watash Tashi Kai Mara, Kono Hea no Tonari Ni Arimas. The media meeting will be in room number 202, which is over there. 
。えー、次にライトニングトークです。えー、ライトニングトークは、えー、5分間で行われる短い、えー、プレゼンテーションのことです。えー、楽しくても5分、えー、つまらなくても5分、えー、より多くの人に発表する機会を持っていただくための企画です。えー、Python に関係あってもなくても OK です。えー、参加登録は、えー、1階にあります、ホワイトボードで、えー、することができます。We will have、uh, lightning talks at the end of、uh, each day. And lightning talks are short five minute talks about anything you want. It can be about Python, it doesn't have to be, as long as it's interesting or funny or、uh, good.、Um, if you can just、uh, write a presentation today during the conference if you want to, and you can sign up on the first floor on a whiteboard. えー、ライトニングトークの会場は、えー、ここ201と202です。The lightning talks will be in room 201 and 202。えー、次に、えー、ランチです、えー。今年はお弁当を用意しています。ランチは1階のカフェテリア、えー、201、202で,で食べることができます。えー、それ以外の部屋は、えー、利用できないのでご注意ください。えー、ランチですが、えー、ハラルとベジタブルそれぞれ用意しております。Uh, for lunch, we have prepared lunch boxes,、uh, which we'll hand out in the cafeteria on the first floor. Uh, you can eat on the first floor or in room number 201 or 202. Please do not eat in other areas.、Uh, we also prepared halal and vegetarian、uh, lunch boxes. Please don't use the、um, back half of the cafeteria downstairs. And on the second floor, you can use this. では、すぐれたトークを行った、えー、3人の発表者が、えー、選ばれます、えー。表彰式は2日目の、えー、クロージングで行います。皆さん、ぜひ、えー、投票してください。投票フォームは1日目は、えー、1日目と2日目の URL はそれぞれ、えー、表示しております次にこのイベントのハッシュタグは、えー、ご覧の通りです、えー、トークの感想や質問などをどんどんツイートして盛り上げていきましょう Uh, please feel free to talk about PyCon Japan a lot on Twitter.、Uh, please use these hashtags.、Uh, you can use the hashtags for the specific rooms if you want to talk about a specific talk or just a general hashtag if you want to talk to, about the conference as a whole.、えー、次に、えー、PyCon JP2017 公式アプリについてです、えー。Android 版、iOS 版それぞれリリースされておりますので、えー、ぜひダウンロードしてみてください。Uh, we prepared mobile apps for you、uh, for the conference、uh, for both Android and iOS.、Uh, you can download them. At these URLs or find them in your app store. 次に、この会場内ではフリー Wi-Fi が利用できます。利用方法に関しては接続案内が、この部屋では後ろの柱のところに、また館内それぞれ至るところに掲示してありますのでご覧ください。We have free Wi-Fi during the conference. The information on how to connect to it is in this room at the back and it's also posted around the conference venue. Uh, we apologize for the complicated sign up procedure. えー、次に、えー、レシート、えー、領収書発行なんですが、えー、ビジネスチケット、チュートリアルチケット、パトロンチケットを購入の方のために、えー、領収書発行のためのウェブサイトを現在開発中ですので、もう少々お待ちください。Uh, if you have a business tutorial or patron ticket,、uh, you may get a receipt if you need one. Uh, we are currently preparing the website to get that receipt for you, so please be patient. えー、次にイベント期間中の注意事項です。えー、まず、えー、行動規範は遵守してください。えー、また、えー、撮影に関する注意ですが、えー、記録広報用の写真撮影や、えー、ビデオカメラによる公演の撮影を行う予定です。えー、写真はレポート記事に、えー、使用いたしますのでご,ご了承ください、えー。参加者による会場内の撮影は原則として OK ですので、えー、皆さん、どんどん会場内の、えー、トークの様子ですとか、えー、その他雰囲気を、えー、写真に収めていってください。Uh, next, a few words of caution.、Um, please read and respect the code of conduct of the conference and follow it、uh, the whole conference, including all the social events.、Um, please be aware that we will be taking pictures and recording video、uh, that we will use uh, to uh, showcase our conference later. 
And of course, uh, you may also feel free to take uh, pictures or record videos yourself. えー、次に会場内の注意点です、えー。通路で話す際には他の参加者の妨げにならないよう、えー、気をつけてください。また2階の一部通路は早稲田大学との共有スペースです。譲り合ってご利用ください。また、えー、この建物は禁煙です、えー。建物の外の喫煙場所でお願いしてます。Basada University students and staff, so please be mindful of them as well. Also, very important the whole building is non smoking. If you wish to smoke, please do so in the designated smoking area outside. Please do not enter the back half of the cafeteria on the first floor. Thank you. えー、次に落とし物なくし物などがある際は205で対応いたします、uh, anything, anything, えー、もしわからないことがあればこちらの T シャツですねこちらの T シャツを着ているスタッフに、えー、お気軽にお尋ねください if you have any questions or troubles or Or if there's anything we can do to help you,、um, please come talk to、uh, one of the staff, which you can recognize by our nice yellow t shirts. <laughs> so let's get started with our first keynote.、Uh, keynote のスピーカーは Peter Wong さんです。Uh, our speaker on the first day is Peter Wong.、Uh, Peter Wong さんは Anaconda の共同設立者で CTO です。Uh, 15年以上にわたり、商業的な科学計算と可視化ソフトウェアを開発しています。Peter Wang is the Chief Technology Officer of Anaconda and he's been developing commercial scientific computing and visualization software for over 15 years. Please give him a warm welcome. それではお願いいたします Thank you, everyone.、Um, thank you to the organizers. Thank you very much for having me as your keynote speaker today. This is actually my first Python presentation、uh, outside of the United States. And I'm very, very glad and very honored to be able to do it here in Tokyo. So, today,、uh, I'm going to talk about three main things.、Um, first, I'll talk about、uh, my journey、uh, with Anaconda, the company, as well as All of the various things that we include inside the distribution. Then I will talk about why we should use Python for data analysis. And then、uh, I'll talk about what I think the future of、um, Python and the future of data science, what these things might look like. So, first, my journey with Anaconda. About me, just a little bit.、Um, I actually am not a computer scientist. Um, I uh, went to school uh, for physics and have a degree in physics from Cornell University.、Uh, but right after I graduated college, I went and got a job as a professional software developer and I worked on computer graphics software, which is a lot of fun. After that, I ended up finding a job doing scientific software development, primarily in Python. And there I built some libraries and helped maintain some libraries like Chaco and Traits. This was in the middle of the 2000s. And then in the,、uh, in the 2012, I founded Continuum Analytics, which we just renamed two weeks ago to Anaconda.、Um, but I founded that company with Travis Oliphant, who many of you may know as the creator of NumPy and SciPy. So、uh, after creating Anaconda or Continuum Analytics, 
uh, we did a number of things actually very quickly. Um, first, uh, one of the things I'm very proud of is that I helped create the Pi Data conference and uh, community. Um, really organizing that and getting that off the ground was, was my idea and I really got that off the ground. And now there are, I think, tens of thousands of people registered for Pi Data meetups around the world. I think there's one here in Tokyo, in fact. Um, we also created the Anaconda distribution in um, the summer of 2012. Uh, we also came up with the idea for the Conda package manager. And uh, I created the, well, I call it bokeh, but I'm probably mispronouncing it. <laughs> People here know how to pronounce it better than me. But uh, I created a web visualization library called bokeh. And then we also created um, Blaze and Numba, many of these things. And one of the things that I spend a lot of my time doing now is I think a lot about how Python uh, can be used and uh, how it is used for data and for science, as well as data science um, and machine learning and all these other things that are very popular right now. But if we look back to five years ago, when we first started, this is actually a picture of Travis, my co-founder, and we were at our first Strata Big Data Conference in California. And back then, in the spring of 2012, we had just attended this Big Data Conference, and we held a Pi Data event. It was actually the first Pi Data event. Um, and some of these slides are actually from Travis's talk there. And so at Strata, we saw many people talking about Hadoop, talking about big data. They were looking at using Java for data management. But of course, all of the actual data analysis they were doing was being done in Python and in R. And there was a whole lot of R versus Python language war kind of things going on back in 2012. Um, but Travis and I were not content with the state of things. We saw that Python could play a very significant role Travis made the slide that's from The Little Prince that shows a snake swallowing the elephant. Um, he was also talking about using compilers to make Python faster. It was also at that PyData event that we were very fortunate to have Guido Van Rossum stopping by. And we talked to him about things like the matrix multiplication operator. We talked to him about quoting expressions, and you know things like that. Um, but we also tried to talk to him about fixing the Python packaging problem. And so this actually, this picture shows Travis and Wes McKinney, who is the creator of Pandas, and Guido Van Rossum. And, um, and when we asked Guido to fix the packaging problem, he told us that we should do it ourselves. <laughs> and so we did. Uh, and that's how we came up with Conda and Anaconda, which I think quite elegantly solves the difficult packaging problems uh, for the scientific and the data science community in Python. Yeah, so we accepted this challenge. Um, and so for those who don't know what Anaconda is, very briefly I'll give you an overview. Um, it is basically a very simple way and a very reliable way to get binary versions of many of the very popular but difficult to build packages in libraries in the Python ecosystem. Uh, we also have a really robust and very nice package manager um, that has a mechanism for isolating low-level library paths and dependencies so that you get a more robust virtual env um, when you're using our package manager. And although we created this for Python, the technology we used is language independent. So we actually support R and we support Java and JavaScript and Scala, many languages. And we run cross-platform. So it runs natively on Windows, on Linux, and on Macintosh. Um, and in my previous slide, it says Anaconda is popular. Uh, when I say popular, this is what I mean. So you can see from this chart that we are at two and a half million downloads of Anaconda and Miniconda every month every month. Um, and for those who are familiar with it, you probably don't download Anaconda all the time. You download it once and then you do Conda update, right? 
So this shows new people, really, a lot of them downloading and installing Anaconda. Of course, oh, this <laughs> slide messed up a little bit. Um, this is all due to the growing importance of data science and machine learning, I think. Uh, many people are adopting Python for these things, and Anaconda is commonly recommended in many books and many classes. Uh, yesterday on Stack Overflow, they had a blog post where they wrote extensively about how Python is the fastest growing language. Um, in the, in the, what they call the wealthy countries, Python was by far the fastest growing language over the last five years. Um, in the less wealthy countries, Python was still the fastest growing language, um, but it had not reached the level of popularity as it has in the, the, the wealthier countries. So the packaging problem, of course, was not the only problem that was facing Python at the time, in, back in 2012. Um, there were a lot of people complaining about performance. And so you had to choose between writing NumPy code um, or maybe using Cython uh, or going to lower level writing C code. Um, and Julia was becoming popular at that time. People were talking about the just-in-time compiler for Julia. And so to solve that problem, we created Numba, which I think is quite popular now for, for, this, for this particular problem. There was also no system for building simple data-driven web applications. The R world had a library called Shiny. There was no such thing for Python. Um, so we created Bokeh to serve as a Shiny and a D3 for Python. And of course, in Python, parallelism was difficult. Now many people are familiar with the multi-threading problems with Python for writing web applications, but in the data, in the scientific applications for Python, parallelism was possible, but it was awkward. And so we created Dask, uh, which has parallel data frames and arrays. And it also helped solve a related problem, which was that Python had very many difficulties working with data sets that were bigger than memory. And so Dask allows you to work with data sets larger than memory. So we created all of these things starting, Dask came later, but the first two we started in 2012. And uh, I think we've been quite successful in helping to solve some of these fundamental problems that Python faced for data science. So now, in 2017, the situation is much better. Um, Python, you know, very popular. Everyone is learning it. Universities, large ones, are teaching it. Um, it's proven in production at many places. At PayPal, at Netflix, at places like Airbnb, large startups, small startups, big companies like JP Morgan, Bank of America, lots of people are using it in production. And it has vastly outstripped its other scripting language competitors, like Perl and Ruby. In the middle of the 2000s, those were very popular. Um, they're still popular now, but in the, in the middle of the 2000s, those two languages were extremely competitive with Python. Now, Python has far exceeded them. And then, Wow, much louder now. <laughs> um, Python is also growing much faster than pure analysis languages like R and SAS and MATLAB. Um, even though data analysis and data science is so popular, this sounds a lot better, wow, okay. Um, even though data science is growing in popularity, Python is, I think, growing faster than those alternative languages um, for data science. And for uh, deep learning, which of course is an extremely hot area of data science and, and machine learning, uh, Python is the most popular language for that, right? There's really not much alternative there. Um, and one of the other things that's very important is that the Python 2 versus Python 3 problem is less of an issue now for most people. In fact, Python is so popular, this just showed up last week. Um, I don't know how many of you may have seen it but it is a Yves Saint Laurent perfume commercial. And it features a handsome artificial intelligence researcher. Actually, let me see if I can show this video for you guys. Um, okay, where's my cursor? Is it there yet? Oh, it's over there. There it is, okay. Why? It may 
makes everything possible. <laughs> you see that? He's using IPython. Yeah. That's amazing. So, uh, maybe he smells like this perfume, I don't know, but he's definitely using IPython, right? So anyway, the point is, when open source technologies are making it into perfume commercials, you know you're really hitting mainstream, right? Um, yeah, he's very handsome, anyway. So Python has grown in popularity, and um, we, you know, there's many of, of these things that are very popular with it, but we should also, I think, still ask ourselves the question, why should we use Python for data? Of course, people are using it for data, but why should we use it for data? Um, and is it because it has, you know, is it because it's so new and it has all the latest and greatest libraries, it's cutting edge, all these things? And actually, the thing is that Python and NumPy are, they're newer than things like SAS, but they're still pretty old. Python is actually 24 years old this year, and um, in the United States we say if Python were a baby, it could vote now. Um, don't know who it would vote for, but anyway. Uh, NumPy is 10 or 11 years old, uh, depending on how you count it. Now, Python, I mean, NumPy, it actually embodies ideas from APL and from Fortran, which are much older. They're, they're from the 1960s. But nonetheless, NumPy itself is 10 years old. And so while we do have some very neat technologies inside the Python landscape, including some of the latest developments in machine learning, um, I actually think that the key value proposition for Python lies in a different aspect of it. So if you look um, at the history of Python, uh, NumPy is derived from Fortran, right? But Python has different influences. And one of the influences is the language ABC, which uh, I've shown a little bit of its Wikipedia entry here. Um, and you can see from here that ABC was designed to be a teaching language. And Python learned some things from ABC. So one of the things I like to say is that Python is the only major modern application development language that has its roots in a teaching language. Pascal and Delphi, right? Those, Pascal was a teaching language. But other things like basic, you know, the, the basic, I guess Visual Basic is kind of used for scripting things. But in terms of the major, major software languages, Python is the only one that has this background as a teaching language. And this is really, really important. So before the Zen of Python and you know, import this and ideas like readability counts, uh, there's one obvious way to do that. Before all of that, the creator of the language started with a teaching language. And that language has to be accessible by design. It has to be, you can't just create a very complicated thing and try to make it easier to use. You have to design it from the beginning and keep that design principle through the entire evolution of the language. So that's one of the fundamental design guidances for Python over the 20 some odd years that everyone's been working on it. And this teaching and accessibility characteristic means that we've actually been able to reach across a spectrum of users. So what we see nowadays is that software developers are not the only ones that need to or want to code. Um, historically, each of the other types of technical staff in a business, they have their own preferred tools, as you see from the picture here, right? The people who are data analysts or business analysts, they tend to use things like Excel. They might use Visual Basic. They might use graphing tools or business intelligence tools. Um, and then the analysts in the middle, the, the more sophisticated um, uh, predictive modelers, whatever you might call them, they would tend to use things like SAS or SPSS. And then, of course, the software developers would use many different programming languages, Java, C++, C Sharp. But Python has the technical depth to be a great application development language, and it has the great libraries to be a fantastic numerical programming language. And it's accessible and readable by non-experts. So this is unique to Python, that it can reach across all three different kinds of, of people. And I, actually, I would challenge people to think about, to come up with any other example of, of any other mainstream programming tool or language or system that can do this. That you can do very quick and powerful data analysis that you can then show off to someone who's not a programmer, and they can make some sense of it. And then you can also give it to someone who is a software developer and has a lot of opinions about how to do software. 
and, uh, and have them understand it and, and like what it does. Now, just because the same language and the same syntax can be used in all these areas doesn't mean that the same person can write good code for all three types of activities. So data scientists are not the same as software developers. And I, I like to say that data scientists tend to use code the way my daughter uses a hammer. Um, surprisingly effective and usually minimal bloodshed. But you're not going to build a house this way. And so depending on who you ask in a business, they'll probably have a very different view of Python. Right? So Python is actually one of the most misunderstood languages in the world because there are tribes and ecosystems in the Python um, community. There are people who mostly focus on web. There's people who use it for uh, system administration and orchestration. Um, there's, of course, the SciPy and the PyData people. There's people who do graphical scripting, all sorts of different people. And so um, when it's in a business environment, IT people and other software developers who don't understand Python, they will tend to pigeonhole it. They'll tend to think of it as only one kind of thing. Depending on you know, what direction they're looking at it from, they'll think of it as, oh, just a scripting tool, or oh, it's one of these weird numerical languages or whatever. right? Um, but Python can actually be powerfully used in all these different ways. So despite those challenges and despite the fact that it gets misunderstood, I think the main promise of Python is that it can serve as an accessible data analysis language for the mass public, for everyone. Um, some technologists, they actually believe that people will continue to rely on pointing and clicking and kind of you know, graphical user interface tools and they will never get any more sophisticated than that. But I think that nowadays, with coding and programming being taught at such an early age for so many children, we're going to actually rapidly enter an era where more and more people are able to understand code a little bit. And so Python is an ideal way to get everyone access to meaningful code. And it's less just a programming language, and it's more, I think, like the new calculus or trigonometry. I mean, it's computational statistics, right? And so in the future, I believe that to be an effective worker in really any kind of knowledge uh, field, you will need to know some basic statistics, and you'll probably need to know Python, at least how to read it. And if you don't, then you'll risk that your job will be replaced by a Python script, <laughs> written by someone who does know Python. Um, and so the, the, the bottom line is I like to think of it, so Python is not just software, it's thoughtware. And what I mean by that distinction is that software is something that we put on computers to tell computers what to do. But thoughtware is actually something we put in our own heads to extend our thoughts into computers. And so, so the computer is an extension of the human mind. And as a, just a data point for that assertion, uh, in case you think I'm exaggerating, if you look at this picture, this was taken just a couple of weeks ago. And this is a classroom, the largest classroom at Berkeley, uh, University of California at Berkeley. It's 1,200 students, and they're enrolled in a class called Data 8, which is the introductory data science class at Berkeley. Um, they're all using Jupyter Notebooks. They're all using Python. And they're, they're all learning Python. But here's the thing. Most of these students are not majoring in computer science. They are students in biology, in economics, in humanities, all these things. Um, but they're all going to learn Python and Jupyter Notebooks, and they're going to learn how to do some data analysis. So if that's the kind of users we're getting, and that's the kind of growth we're going to continue to have, what does the future hold for Python itself, right? and for Python users, and for the Python dev community? People are going to come to conferences like this. So I have a few predictions to make. Number one, I think that Python will actually become the preferred way of developing cognitive applications. Um, that is, applications that have online learning to them and online training. Right now, people still think of data science and data modeling as a separate process from the application development. So they sort of explicitly build a model and move it over. I think in the future, we're going to see these things combining. And so software developers, data scientists, they're going to work closer and closer together to build end-to-end -end cognitive applications. Um, and I think Python will become the preferred language for doing a lot of that. I also think there's going to be a steady income stream for people who maintain Python 2 applications, because those are not going away, not for a long time. Um, 
even though Python 3 adoption is going great, but there's, there's actually a lot more Python 2 out there than I think most people realize. But lastly, uh, another thing I think is very important is that multi-language interoperability will be greatly improved once people uh, adopt Apache Arrow. And um, the reason for that is because right now, there's a big divide between things like Python and R, uh, things that can speak to native C and um, uh, things like that, and then the Java world, and the JVM, Scala, and Groovy, and all these things. And right now, if you're using a Hadoop or a Spark environment, oftentimes Python and R are second-class citizens. Um, when we can actually adopt a common uh, storage technology like Arrow, then we can actually bridge between these two different worlds. So I think that's going to actually massively improve things. So I'm very excited about that. And then lastly, I think that constant improvements um, in memory and storage, as well as GPUs, that will mean that people will continue doing lots of Python locally, not distributed, locally on big workstations. There's a lot of great data science you can do if you just get a big enough computer uh, without having to worry about all this distributed stuff. So, uh, but the most important thing to keep in mind is that Python is like a big pile of Legos. It's what you make of it. Um, many of the things that are in Python today are created by people who are users. They just started using it. Um, and it's very easy to build cool new things and show other people stuff. Um, so the language itself evolves and adapts as the developer community actively drives its evolution. Right? It's, it's a very organic and, and rapidly evolving thing on many different uh, fronts. So a really great quote from Alan Kay is that the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So you know, I encourage all of you to go out and build things and invent things in Python as the way of predicting it. But as you're doing that, one thing I would encourage for people to keep in mind is to have clear thinking about open source and what open source means. So if you ask a bunch of open source developers uh, at a conference like this, or maybe at uh, OSCON, or one of these other open source conferences, you tend to find the attitude that it's not just about licenses. Right? If you just take a piece of code and you put an open source license on it, that's not what open source as a movement or an ethos is about. But rather, it's about freedom, it's about community. You know, those are the kinds of things they talk about. And, um, and one of the things that they talk about now more and more is the question of sustainability. Right? The, the open source world has um, people talk about the sustainability problem because there's not enough developers to support how many users there are. And in recent years, we've seen you know, the technical world being embarrassed by how little dev support there was for things like OpenSSL um, and things like that. Now, the Python and the PyData world has actually um, had the good fortune that the things we work on are right in the critical path to business value for many, many businesses and organizations. Um, that's how they do their analysis. So everyone from the American National Science Foundation to DARPA or to commercial entities like Bloomberg and Two Sigma, they're directly funding development efforts and the core technologies in, in Python and PyData. Um, and also nonprofits like NumFocus are really helping to organize and connect those dollars to meaningful impact. So that's been really critical. But another key way that we sustain uh, open source development, another key thing to remember about open source, is that businesses use open source now more and more. I don't know what the situation is in Japan, but in the US, it's certainly become much more mainstream for businesses to use open source. But we have to understand why businesses are so eager to adopt open source. And it used to be that people would say, well, it's cheaper because it's free. <laughs> And it turns out, well, actually, maintaining software is not free, right? But it's actually neither of those two things are what I've found to be the reasons why businesses like to use Python or like to use open source. The, one of the core things that drives businesses is that they want to avoid being locked into a vendor. And so by using open source, they can keep their data and their data analysis infrastructure free from being locked in. And that's actually a huge thing. Um, and, and another sort of related to that is, you know, the question of lock-in. Well, what does that mean? Locked into what? And it's actually locked into the rate of change that the vendor is willing to um, take on for their product. If you use a proprietary software, you can't get new improvements to it unless the vendor puts them in.
But if you use open source software, you are free to adopt any innovation that comes from the global community of innovators at any time that you want. So a key thing about open source for business adoption that everyone should keep in mind is it is the freedom to adopt innovation and freedom to participate in that innovation. And related to that, I would like to remind everyone and reiterate to all of you that you are part of a big community and that you are all responsible, actually, for growing this community. Um, Brett Cannon, a very famous, uh, very well-known Python uh, maintainer, he likes to say, I came for the language, but I stayed for the community. And I find that to be deeply true. I look forward to meeting many of you and speaking with many of you uh, in the coming days. But everywhere I go, Python developers that I meet are friendly, and they're nice, and they're very smart, and very motivated and passionate. Um, and so the overall Python community that I've seen internationally is very welcoming and uh, very patient with newcomers. So as a member of that community, it's really on you to sort of extend that approach and to extend that kind of uh, attitude. So I've often heard it said that uh, in, the, you know, in, the, in the data science languages, people talk about R and all the great libraries in R, and they'll say, well, R has this huge user community. And so I think that Python, um, of course, it has many users too, but I actually want people to say that Python has a huge maker community. And that's a big difference. If you look at all of the major libraries in Python for PyData, for SciPy, those are all created by people. Almost all of them are created by people who are not software developers or software engineers. They were users first. So I would like it to be true that the Python community is a good maker community. And the thing about making things is that you don't have to make just software. You can make talks, you can make tutorials, you can make podcasts, um, you can host lunches at your work and teach your, your uh, colleagues about Python, um, or you can try to start or participate in a local PyData meetup. Um, this is just some of the little sc the screenshot of some of the videos um, from uh, Py PyData meetups in the past, PyData conferences, PyData meetups. And there are hundreds and hundreds of them over the last few years that we've been doing this. Uh, maybe someday I'll have one of your videos on, on there. There's many more than just that on their YouTube channel. But it's really, really amazing to see how Python has grown. And it's all because everyone is putting in the effort. So in terms of predicting the future, in terms of what's next, it's really on all of you to make what the future of Python and PyData looks like. Thank you very much. So I believe we have some time for questions, yes? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we have some time for questions. So if you have a question, um, please raise your hand or something. <laughs> if no one has questions, I'll ask myself questions and then we can just go from there. Thank you for your great presentation. Uh, I really love uh, Jupyter Notebook and uh, Anaconda uh, package. Uh, I'm Takeshi Acts, and uh, uh, <coughs> I'm organizing a Python community in Japan, uh, Start Python Club. And uh, uh, thanks to the, the great attention on Python, we, the, the, the number of our club is exceeding uh, 2700. And uh, uh, we open a uh, workshop every month, and uh, uh, more than uh, 100 people coming to our event. So I really agree with your uh, uh, idea, uh, you, your opinion. Uh, Python has great uh, uh, capability for data science. My question is, uh, I witnessed some difference between uh, US community and Japanese community. Uh, in May, I visited Open Data Science Conference in Boston that is called ODSC. I, I think you, you, may, you may know that. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there are uh, over 
30, 30, 100, 3,000 3, people are coming. Mm -hmm. So much more than uh, this volume. Mm -hmm. And uh, many people, are also students, are learning Python for data science. And uh, my issue is how to uh, enlarge or how to uh, facilitate uh, the community, community in Japan. So please uh, make an advice for me. Thank you. Yeah, um, what, when you say you notice a difference between the US and the um, Japanese communities, um, can, you, can you tell me some of those differences or what, what, what you thought? First, first is the population of the uh, Python uh, developer and also data scientists. I think uh, I, I'm not I'm not blaming on you, <laughs> Japanese people. <laughs> I'm I'm really uh, friends of you, but uh, so uh, as now uh, uh, organizer of the uh, small community in Japan, uh, I'd like to do something for our colleagues in Japan. So uh, one one is the population of the uh, developers, and uh, another one is quality. Maybe, uh, I, unfortunately, I could, I, I've never visited uh, PyCon, PyCon in US, mm -hmm. but uh, I, in my knowledge, there are a few people uh, going to US, uh, US PyCon to have a presentation. Mm -hmm. I think it, it, it is a quality difference. Mm. So th that, that is, uh, I think that is kind of issue so yeah, that's a that's a great that's a very deep and rich topic. Um, so first of all, the difference between the U.S. and the Python, uh, sorry, between the U.S. and the Japanese Python communities is one topic. The difference between the data science communities in the U.S. and Japan is a different but related topic. Um, one of the things in the Stack Overflow blog post they talk about is that among the, the um, leading kind of wealthier countries, of course Japan is one of them, um, the adoption of Python is about two years ahead of the um, sort of less economically developed countries. And that's very interesting. Those actually tend to have more PHP because they're doing offshore web development. Okay? So, the, um, so in terms of the maturity of adoption of technology itself, Right? It's different in different countries. We noticed that Europe was about a year behind America on some of the early big data stuff. Um, they're catching up now quite a bit on advanced machine learning and AI kind of things. But um, So even on things like that, you can see there's a time shift between different countries. And the ODSC conference in Boston, it's a large conference, but it's also a, it's kind of a weird commercial slash community conference. Um, and, and that's, I guess it's being recorded, so I'm trying to think about the best way to say this. The community conferences are run by the community, like PyCon, you know, here or elsewhere. It's run by the community for the benefit of the community. Um, industry conferences in the United States, uh, like Strata, um, like some of the, um, uh, big like AWS conferences or you know when they're run by vendors or they're run by people like O'Reilly those commercial oriented conferences they're there to make money <laughs> they're there to make money by selling tickets for tutorials they make money by selling booth space in these very large conference centers um, and that's a different kind of purpose than serving community ODSC is kind of between these things right they don't charge that much money put to put up booths um, they solicit the community to come and give talks, but they do also want to make money. And so they have to have a lot of people show up. And to have a lot of people show up, you need a lot of rooms with a lot of programs and all these things. So, that's, so the kind of conference you're trying to run makes a big difference. Now, around the topic of just how do you grow community here in Japan, I think the best guidance is to make sure no matter what you do, that you do it in a Japanese way. <laughs> So I love Japanese culture and design. I love um, so many things, Japanese food, obviously. Um, but in every single country, there are cultural elements and there are business dynamics 
Um, there's educational dynamics that are all very specific to that country itself. So the right thing to do in America that we've done to grow the community there may not at all be the right thing to do here in Japan. Now, some things, of course, are going to be common, right? You want to have good talks. Um, you want to have uh, a, a welcoming environment, things like that. But in terms of specific things you might do, you might find, for instance, um, at, at least in America, we, we tend to believe that Japanese people really love robots, right? So maybe if you actually have topical areas or focuses on uh, AI and you know, data science for robotics and automation, you might find you know, a way to draw people in in that regard. I don't know, it's just an idea. Um, hopefully that's not, that doesn't offend anyone, but like, Americans really believe the Japanese people really like robots. I don't know if it's true or not. Um, but, but that's the sort of thing that you might find. You might find that there are educational initiatives here, right? In the UK, they had an educational initiative to get uh, school children programming. So they gave everyone Raspberry Pis. And so the Python community there took advantage of that to get more people you know, doing Python. So it's those kinds of things that you might want to think about here that might be you know, very... Um, um, you know, I would say that the thing that makes it successful is, is what is right for that community in the full cultural context of, of that community. Hopefully that helps. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we can talk more about it later at the conference. Yeah, let's see you Thank you for your question. Uh, Thank you for your uh, great talk. And I, I would ask uh, one question about the how can I say conflict between uh, wheel and conda. So I think yeah, I, I, as you may know, so uh, uh, I think the last issue around uh, wheel is the uh, SciPy uh, wheel of for Windows, and it will be. Uh, Resolved in near future, as you know, and uh, so it is a, a great chance to a great opportunity to, for uh, both community to uh, drive uh, Py, Python data data science things together. So, how do you feel the uh, current fragmentation uh, situation uh, about two community around Conda and uh, Wii? Thank you. That's a great question. I I love to talk about this topic actually. Um, and the, the reason is because uh, even prior to that funny slide about us, you know, bugging Guido to fix the packaging problem. Actually, I'll tell you a funny story before I answer your question. Um, and it was at PyCon about three years ago that Guido came and stopped by our booth. And we started talking to him. And then we realized why packaging in Python was so terrible for so many years. It's because Guido doesn't, he said, I don't use packages. He does, he just... He's like, when we started out, people wanted to do more packages and things like that. I didn't really care, because if I wanted something in the language, I just put it in the language. <laughs> so he never made packages. Um, but of course, we all have suffered, uh, because Python packaging was not very good for a long time. And you know, I've been fighting Python packaging since 1999. So I've been there through all the iterations of setup tools, disutils2, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the thing about it is that Python is very powerful because it has really good support for C extensions. That's what made it powerful for all of the data stuff, and it's going to continue to be a very powerful aspect of Python. But that also brings in all of the problems of managing a C, C++, Fortran dependency chain. And unfortunately, solving some of those problems is beyond the scope of mere, of just Python packaging. And so at the Python packaging summit at PyCon two or three years ago, we talked about this. And the Python packaging authority, the PyPA, the core um, uh, packaging folks, they have explicitly sort of said, this is not a problem we're going to solve. Like, we're going to f figure out how to get people binary packages of SciPy or Matplotlib or Pandas or TensorFlow or something. Um, but then making sure that your Matplotlib binary package has the same JPEG library as OpenCV, I, I, you know, that's not a Python problem. And, and we argued that is a Python problem because Python users have that problem. So by definition, it is a Python problem. And so there's a 
philosophical disagreement about that. So when we built Conda, we built it to be a generic packaging tool, closer to things like Nix or uh, Apt or RPM, actually, than to things like PIP. Um, and in the process of building Conda packages for so many things, we have uncovered so many different little corners and edge cases where things are not compatible or things are a little bit different. And the thing is that none of those problems are really like extremely hard. Some of them are very hard, but most of them are not super hard. The challenge is, and if you look at you know, the growth in Python usage and that room full of 1,200 students from Berkeley, they all brought their own laptops. <laughs> you know, they, to get all of them stood up with the libraries they need and every Jupyter Notebook to run correctly, no matter what it imported, that is every little edge case takes out 10 users, takes out 10 users here, here, there, you know, everywhere. And you eventually end up in a situation where people, you know, when we started in 2012, we created Anaconda because we're starting to do, to do tutorials, and people in 2012 still could not install SciPy reliably alongside Matplotlib. So um, I do hope that we are going to have better wheel support in Conda, and already you can do, you can convert packages back and forth. So I think it, it should be, it would be great to have essentially the same binaries be available as a wheel as um, in the default Anaconda channel. But the broader problem of dependency resolution, of managing um, the C and the Fortran and the C++ packages that underlie all these things, that I think the Python packaging folks have said it's, it's out of scope for them. Um, but it's part of what our Python users need, and so it's in scope for Conda. Yeah, uh, I, I understand your opinion. And I, but I, uh, after, uh, so how can I say, yeah, uh, growth of whole binary package uh, format, mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, it is enough to use uh, for, with some C extension with uh, whole binary, yeah. Uh, I, I feel so it's almost the same as uh, Conda, as well as Conda does. So, yeah, so I, uh, yeah, it's just my, so, uh, just idea, but uh, it will be, it would be nice uh, we can convert from Conda binary to we or we from for we to Conda. So, in, yes. so interactivity uh, will be so more, uh, uh, reduce more, uh, resolve more, uh, good, uh, good, make it, make the situation more better. So, uh, I, yeah, as as you uh, as you said, uh, there are many tribes in the Python world, and the, uh, and but many so package builders are uh, uh, traditional Py Python guys, and many data science guys uh, loves Conda, but tra traditional guys loves. Uh, we use and but we data scientists always use both sides uh, <laughs> packages so that's right. a, uh, always our problems and so if uh, we uh, I hope uh, we will be happy with uh, overcome those fragmented situation I, I hear you on that and I agree with you it would, be, it would be really good to have better interop between them right now the big technical hurdles as far as I understand yep. are that some of the richer metadata that Conda maintains for Conda packages is not, there's, there's not a standard way of representing those in wheels. And some of the, even with many Linux, it doesn't really solve some of the deeper, some of the metadata information gets lost. And without that, there's a large number of use cases that we, we can't do in Conda, essentially. Um, so we have to figure out some way. I know there, there's a, a pep out for improving how they handle metadata in wheels. So I, I think it's all solvable, right? Like many technical problems, this is a solvable one. We just have to get the right people in the room to really sit down and, and, and try to work on it. Um, and I think right now we've had a number of uh, iterations on Conda to make it more featureful and improve stability. Um, and the better compatibility with wheels is one of the major roadmap items for us for Conda in the future. So, Thank you for your uh, great, uh, uh, great, great talk. Thank you for your good question. Anybody else? Oh, one over there. Oh, okay. Hi. This is hi. 
this is more of a business uh, related question maybe, but I'm just wondering how uh, Continuum came to focus on Python. And then in terms of uh, the tech stack, um, what was the decision process around that? And then how do you make changes or adjustments to it moving forward? To the tech stack or to our decision to use Python or what are the? Uh, either really. Um, wow. You know, I, I, at first, I thought that was going to be a really easy question because we sort of we started by saying, well, I mean, we've been doing Python, and we love Python, and we didn't want to have to write data analysis stuff in JavaScript, which is what it was looking like. Um, so um, it wasn't so much a decision, it was an assumption. <laughs> We're going to be a Python company because we love Python. Um, uh, it's sort of like SpaceX deciding to go into space and not underwater just because that's what they started to do. Um, now, but but there is a there is a, a second part of your question, which is a very good one, which is um, uh, that the you know how do we make adjustments to that, right? What if we love Python so much, but in the future Python actually becomes really terrible and we shouldn't love it so much anymore? <laughs> um, how do we adjust that assumption? And um, and I think the key thing for us is as we've grown as a business, we've started to see you know we started doing consulting. That's the only way we could pay the bills. We're investing in building new open source projects. That's not a good way to make money. So if anyone wants to do a startup where you just write code for free, code that doesn't work and doesn't have any users, you're not going to make any money. However, um, over time, we've built products. And we started selling products. And that's become um, pretty, pretty successful. And so it's freed us up to think broad, more broadly about what is it that the industry wants? What are they doing? Where are the gaps? And why are they using Python? Right? The tools that they're using uh, right now, uh, like SAS or MATLAB, those are two. I think SAS is the, mm, the largest or the most valuable privately held software company in the world. They have a lot of money. Right? Why are people converting and using Python? And the reason is because these tools in the open source, that the open source community created, they're doing things that those other things don't do as well. And the energy of that is something that my co-founder Travis and I both really love. We're very passionate about supporting that kind of community of, of inventors, creators. Um, but Python is not the only community like that. R is another one, right? And there's been commercial entities in R, like Revolution Analytics, which got bought by Microsoft. Uh, R Studio, um, new, I think R Brain just came out. So um, that's another community that could use support and that we could you know, maybe build things for. Um, and over time, we might see other things emerging around data sets, around machine learning things. Um, you know, our, our goal is to, wherever possible, create um, things that an ecosystem can grow up around. You know, the way that they, they sink ships so they can grow coral reefs around them, that's kind of what we like to be doing as a company. So if we find other opportunities where there's a lot of nutrients but no coral, we'll think about doing something new. we think about it. So as a company, you just kind of raise a flag and say, we're using Python over no, here? No, no. I mean, as a company, we're trying desperately to pay the salaries of our employees, right? We're a venture-funded company, and we, you know, there's a lot of the venture capitalists and uh, investors, they see a lot of opportunity and promise in the machine learning and data science space. Um, and so there is an urgency, and there is a very hard question we have to ask ourselves any time we invest, even in our existing open source stack uh, of things. So Thank we you. don't have infinite money yet. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have time for about one more question. No more. Anybody? Come on. Don't be so shy. <laughs> no? No. OK. There right. was. OK. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Um, before you leave, very short announcement. Um, uh, yeah, uh, the simultaneous translation devices, please leave them on your table. Don't take them home with you. Uh, otherwise, we have to pay a lot of money.
、えっと、同日薬草値は解消しますので、テーブルの上に置いたまま退出してください。お願いいたします。以上です。And yeah, now there's a short break until 10:55. Thank you.